Epi 2026. I'm going to start the videos this year with genetics. So let's talk about this new paper that's in examining genetics in MECFS. The paper uses the Decode ME genetic data set from the United Kingdom. You may remember that I spoke about this data set previously. The first paper on it identified locations in the genetic code where MECFS individuals were more likely to have certain variations than did healthy controls. And that earlier study was looking for major monogenic or, or direct single genetic causes of MECFS. And I'll link uh, to that video at the end of this one. Now, one takeaway from that initial analysis is no, there's not a single genetic cause of MECFS. So we will not be saying, hey, we just ran your genetic sequence and we found that you have the MECFS variant. That is clearly not going to happen. And nor are there a small number of specific MECFS causes like 8 or 10, because most MECFS individuals in that data set did not show abnormal deviations in any of the main identified locations of interest. Now, that could mean that MECFS is not genetic, um, or it could mean that MECFS is genetic or partially genetic, but it involves interactions between several causative factors. And there's really, there's nothing strange about that. Very few diseases are truly monogenic with specific pathological variants in very well-defined regions of the genetic code. There's just a, a few classic examples. Huntington's disease is, is the one we usually talk about. A cystic fibrosis uh, and sickle cell anemia is another example. And even in those cases, we haven't cured any of those diseases yet. Anyway, there's still work on gene therapies, um, but more work is definitely needed in all three of those diseases. The gene therapies I've been following have been turning out to be trickier than what anyone was hoping. Anyway, this research group right here, they took the Decode ME CFS, I'm sorry, just Decode ME data set, and they asked, what if instead of looking for single direct causes of ME CFS, we look for combinations of genetic variants that when you put them together, they do a better job of predicting MECFS. So let's see what they did and let's talk about if it's important and if so, why. All right, well, this paper, first of all, it's a preprint, which means it has not yet been peer reviewed. It's been put into a repository, public repository, where people can review it and they can provide comments. And that means that this manuscript um, is not in the final published form, more than likely. And the results and the conclusions could change depending on the peer reviewers' comments and requests. Um, but in any case, you should be able to access it in its current form at the link in the video description below if you want to review it. But it is a pretty long paper. All right, here it is. Um, now, my test for whether a scientific paper title is not too long is if I can say the whole thing with a single breath. So uh, let's try that. All right. Identification of novel reproducible combinatorial genetic risk factors for myalgic encephalomyelitis in the DECODE ME patient cohort in commonalities with long COVID. Okay, so I was able to do it. So this title is of an acceptable length. Now their process allows them to create combinations of one to four genetic variations or SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. And then they can see if those unique combinations are seen more in MECFS than in healthy controls. And by the way, the control data sets are from the UK Biobank. Now they looked at, it looks that they examined about 13,000 individuals with MECFS. And this analysis utilizes roughly 400,000 SNPs. And that's before all the special combinations. So really a complex, massive data set. Now I've decided 
not to go through all the model building and the testing methodology. The authors did a great job explaining the methods in a very clear way in the paper, but there's so many steps and there's so many terms and concepts to define. I realized getting into it, it would just take too long to go through everything. So my apologies uh, to the authors. The most basic way I can explain it is first you have a control data set which represents the healthy population. And then you have a data set of individuals with ME-CFS, and that's used to discover the pathological signatures that are associated with ME-CFS. And then you run those identified signatures through another set of people with ME-CFS. And you do that to see if those signatures you identified in the first group, if they hold up in the independent group. And that helps shake out erroneous false positives. And then you have independent testing data sets to find out how well your final set of signatures predicts MECFS. And so there's a lot of steps using different people to filter and clean the data till you get to the final testing stage. And every stage you have to use different people because it would be cheating to use the same people for training the model and, and then to test it. Okay, so that's what they did. Uh, that, that what they did was more complex than that. There are more stages and more kind of parallel processing, but that's the general idea of it. If you have genetic background, do read the paper. Uh, many of the cleaning and the filtering and the exclusion and the prioritization steps, a lot of them are standard, but many of them are judgment calls. Um, other groups may have done things differently. Uh, but it's very clear that this group really spent a lot of time planning their approach and trying to mitigate problems as best as they could. All right, so they did this, and they found, here's the big number, 22,411 possible genetic combinations or patterns associated with MECFS. And um, as seen in this figure, the more disease signatures a person has, the greater their chance of having MECFS. And so these individuals right here who are in the 90th percentile of the number of signatures that they had. Um, I think I, I'm guessing this group had about 2,000 or so of the disease signatures. They were more likely to have MECFS. Um, in contrast, the low group here, I'm thinking they had around 200 or so of the disease signatures. And, and I'm, again, I'm guessing at those numbers kind of pulling from other figures so someone can correct me if I didn't do that correctly. But the main thing is that the people with the greatest number of these pathological, potential pathological genetic signatures, they're 1.6 times more likely to have MECFS as the people with the fewest numbers of the signatures. My interpretation of that is in the UK, the prevalence of MECFS is about 1%, maybe a little bit less, but I'm gonna to round to 1%. So if you have 100 people and they have the low pattern counts, we would expect one of them to have MECFS, one out of 100. Um, but at 1.64 odds, if you took 100 people from the UK and they all had the high disease pattern counts, you would expect closer to two of them to have MECFS. Now, so practically, these signatures won't be helpful in screening, for example, screening your child to see how likely they are to get MECFS. You can't do this and say, yes, you're likely to get MECFS, or no, you're safe. It's just, it's not predicting enough of the variance to be used in that way. But I don't think that's really the utility or utility of this approach anyway. It's really good at revealing systems of the body or specific proteins where faults appear to be driving MECFS. And they found that the implicated genes are involved in things that we've been looking at already. Uh, neurological dysregulation, uh, inflammation, uh, cellular stress response, and calcium 
signaling. And that's the list they provide in the abstract. And uh, I, th I think a good approach is they propose using this information to prioritize what drugs to repurpose for testing in MECFS. And they highlighted a couple examples that were particularly indicated by their research, rentitolimod, which is amplogen, and aprimolast, which is of Tesla. Okay, so again, I've covered maybe 30% of this paper. Most of it uh, I'm not going to get into with this talk. They present other results, um, such as some overlap with long COVID genetics. And again, I'm not going to talk about that. And also they talk about the overlap with the earlier study and how much it agrees with that. The bottom line, in my view, is that this and the earlier genetic analysis study, they seem to be saying much of the same thing, which is one, MECFS is not caused by specific pathological variants. And so to the extent that MECFS is genetic, it's going to be a combination of multiple genetic traits and probably interactions between genetics and environmental variables, pathogen exposures, and the like, which again is like most diseases with the genetic predisposition. Hypertension or asthma or type 2 diabetes, these are all heavily influenced by genetics, but the genetics interact with other things to cause or to exacerbate the disease. So what does this mean for treatments? Well, it connects very well with my framework for understanding MECFS. We have this label of MECFS with understood symptoms, but I do not believe that MECFS is a single disease. There is instead three or four major types of MECFS that's based on observable pathophysiology. And it's almost certain that those will need distinct treatments. And so I don't believe anyone who says they have the treatment for, fiber, for MECFS. Uh, from all the research I've seen, that's impossible. Uh, we need treatments for all the major pathology types. Um, and there's also, we may need treatments for kind of the sub causes of those major pathologies. And so one of those is chronic microglia activation or neuroinflammation, which is what I spend much of my time in. We may be able to treat the microglia directly, but we may also have to go one level down and treat the causes of the microglia activation. And so we may need to have a few treatments to handle this disorder. And then it keeps going down. And this kind of thing I have at the bottom is just to suggest that it's probably the case, or it seems to be the case, that there are potentially hundreds, or at least a hundred, original causes of MECFS. But that doesn't mean that we need hundreds of treatments. It's just a question of what nodes need to be targeted to most effectively quash the disease. And I do think that these genetic projects will help that quest. Um, but uh, one thing I've mentioned before, um, ultimately, what's going to benefit you personally in the realm of genetics, it may be more about examining your own genetic code and identifying the pathological variants, including the rare pathological variants that you have specifically that's causing your symptoms. And I do hope to talk more about that soon. In any case, uh, there's going to be much more about MECFS genetics coming out this year. I know that for sure, and that's including from the teams that are working with the DECODE ME data set. So I hope we will see some really exciting advances in 2026 in the genetic field. I do want to note, I should always note limitations. The, the main limitation in this data set and the analysis, the authors note this as well, the genetic samples were obtained only from individuals with European ancestry, and most of the world is not European. It's possible that these associations that were identified in the study, they'll completely fall apart in Asian, African, or Latin American, or indigenous populations. We have no idea, and that's an issue that will need to be addressed 
at some time. All right, so that's it. Um, this work really, bottom line, further reinforces the idea that there are many routes or routes to MECFS, and researchers, I believe, need to get away from this goal of finding the cause or the cure or the treatment because too much focus on that could cause us to miss things that may be enormously beneficial for a smaller subgroup of patients. And we, we don't want to miss those important opportunities. And so I see this process more of us kind of chipping away at this huge boulder that is MECFS and hitting it with varied treatments and chipping away, chipping away until we really just get it down until there's nothing left. Okay. Uh, a quick reminder that my PhD level class is starting in about a week. Uh, I don't want it, my research to take a huge hit by the class, and so uh, I may decrease the number of videos instead so I can spend more time on the research. But anyway, I'm not expecting you'll notice any big change, but we'll see as we get into the class. Uh, but I will be back soon.